our first speaker of the day uh, and our keynote speaker, uh, Andrew Aldrin, um, who will be talking about <laughs> ways of space commercialization. And with that in mind, I will invite Andrew to, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Timo. It's great to be here. Let's see what I can do with this. Do we have charts? Cool. Um, so let's see, I've got 15 minutes to talk about the history of commercial space. You know, there was a time that wouldn't be difficult, but um, actually a lot of things are going on right now. Um, there's a road at Kennedy Space Center called Space Commerce Highway. And it's been there for about 30 years. And for about 25 years, it was empty absolutely empty. Today, it's got one of the most gargantuan facilities, space facilities in the world, Blue Origin, literally taken over about a mile. OneWeb is building satellites there. There's a building which is just filled with startup companies. It's pretty amazing. So we live in really interesting times. Um, the title of my talk is Waves of Entrepreneurship, an Agnostic View. And um, spoiler alert, you know, the question is, what's happening with space? And I'll just, I'll tell you right now, I don't know. There are things that are really good and things that are not so good. So anyway, 15 minutes, let's get started. So today is really exciting. Sir Richard was, I don't know if you'd call him the first real commercial tourist, doesn't really qualify. So he's the first billionaire, maybe. Actually, there's a couple of others before him. This is all in one month. So Richard jumped cue on Jeff Bezos, which... Jeff was not happy about. Um, but then, but then probably dropped out of the business for a year, right? Um, and so you got Bezos going up. This is all in one month, and then Elon sort of left out. He was actually going to launch his Starship in that month. So surely, surely, today is the dawn of space entrepreneurship. Actually, it's not entirely true. Space entrepreneurship started as long ago as space itself. I didn't put the chart up here, Timo, because I would have spent the entire day, 15 minutes, talking about Sergei Korolev, who was the first great space entrepreneur. But that's another lecture. So in addition to just the space tourism, which um, is a great business, and it's really high profile, but it's not a lot of money. This is where the money is. Massive constellations. We're going to talk about these constellations in a little while. But space has been around for a long time. We've, we've gone through what I call three waves of commercialization. And since I teach in Florida, I use surfing as a metaphor. The first wave just never really happened. Second wave in the 90s wiped us out. And here we are, the third wave. So I've never given this talk in the UK. Does anybody surf in this? We do have a surfer. I actually don't surf, but I knew them growing up. I grew up in California, and now I'm in Florida. I've seen a lot of waves. This is a dangerous wave. You don't know if it's going to be a really great ride. It's going to wipe you out. And that's a metaphor for where we are today. So what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes are the three waves of commercialization. The first one. The first one came with the space shuttle, ironically enough. So the space shuttle was going to launch 50 times a year at a, well, they didn't talk about price. They believe the cost of a shuttle launch. Does anybody want to guess? A billion? 500 million? 100 million. Going, nobody, everybody thinks it's less than 100 million? Really? Somebody give me a number. What? A billion, so you're going with the billion number. I hear a billion, do I hear 500 million? 100 million. All right, eight million dollars. That's what we thought the shuttle was gonna cost. Eight million dollars. Does anybody know what the real cost is? You're close with a billion, about a billion and a half. So we kind of missed the mark on that one. Nevertheless, in spite of that, we had a very robust series of programs that were being proposed. Companies like Orbital Sciences were gonna build platforms, in space transport systems, space tugs, we had the thing called the Industrial Space Facility, which was going to do real manufacturing in space. We had all kinds of cool things. So let's talk about some of those. 
So the first thing you have to talk, think about when you talk about the 80s was we believed we were going to have hotels in space. This is stuff from Gerard O'Neill. It was actually something also from two, the movie 2001. We believed we were going to be living in space with hundreds of thousands of people in space, and that didn't quite happen. In fact, Pan Am went out of business shortly after this picture, right? However, one of the really interesting things that happened is we were going to turn the space shuttle over to commercial industry. This is, a, this is a picture that I used when I was an executive at the Boeing Company um, talking about space commercialization in 2000. Um, we thought that space, the space shuttle was going to get turned over to pilots and airline pilots were going to fly the space shuttle. And I know this because, in fact, a thing called the Airline Pilots, Space Pilots Association used to come and visit my dad all the time and talk about this stuff. Um, we had the first really commercial launch vehicle, Conestoga. It was a commercially financed launch vehicle. Interesting story about Conestoga is that when they went to launch, when they went to launch, they had the launch vehicle ready to go. They said, we're going to launch, went to the US government, said, time to launch. And the government says, wait, 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 wait. you need a license. And Deke Slayton, who was the chief of the, formerly the chief of the astronauts, said, of course, said, OK, what kind of a license do I need? We'll get back to you on that. You need an export license. Okay, that was ridiculous. It was just going up and going back down. Anyway, what came of that, though, that was important was um, the Commercial Space Launch Act of 1984, which established the legislative basis for space commercialization in the United States today. So that was a good thing that came out of a very bad rocket, as it turns out. We also took a government satellite, Landsat, that was doing pretty good remote sensing industry in images and turned it over to private industry. Fantastic idea. Um, probably comes as no surprise that the US government completely screwed it up, and the whole thing fell apart after a couple of years. But it was a good idea. So things were happening. And then this happened. That was the end of the first wave, which really never ended up with anything really coming of it. So let's talk about the next wave, the one that wiped us out. Late 1990s, early 2000s, we were going to darken the sky with satellites. Teledesic was going to put up 840 satellites, uh, Iridium 77, Skybridge I think was a few hundred, no, 72. Anyway, in total, we were proposing over 1,200 spacecraft were going to be launched over the next five years with a total planned investment of something just north of $66 billion. Uh, the launch vehicle people, if, by the time you're, we're done with this talk, you will understand how I feel about the launch industry. I spent about a decade of my life in the launch industry. Um, I'm not in love with the launch industry, but the launch industry never misses an opportunity to propose more and more vehicles. 13 different launch vehicles were proposed, and what happened? Well. What we ended up with was actually three different, three surviving constellations and three surviving launch vehicles. But we did, we did actually launch about 130 spacecraft that represented about $12 billion of real, no kidding, space investment. This is CapEx in space, which was great. We ended up with three launch vehicle programs. I'll call it two and a half because Sea Launch was not a real launch vehicle program, as it turns out. Anyway, so that's okay, right? A little bit of you know, creative destruction. We've got a real commercial space program. Not so fast, bucko. They all went bankrupt. Everything. 130 spacecraft in space sold in bankruptcy for $80 million. Remember, 12 billion, 80 million. There's an old saying in the space business, if you want to make a small fortune in space, start out with a large one. But this is crazy. This is crazy. This was a complete and total wipeout. We did end up with two launch vehicle programs. The only reason they were sustained was the US government said, look, we've got to have launch vehicles for our spy satellites. So the Atlas and Delta programs survived. But they went through a sort of, if you will, government bureaucratic bankruptcy themselves. 
So, that was the wipeout. This is a quote from one of the rock star analysts of the time frame, a guy named Paul Nesbitt, a Silicon Valley analyst. Um, and he said, look, I'm done with this. I'm not going to invest in these massive capital intensive programs. And what happened in the VC industry was really, really interesting. So the numbers are probably hard to read. This is $100 billion of venture capital. It's US only. But to be honest, if you look at VC numbers, the rest of it, no offense, one of my, one of my students is in the, the UK finance industry. It's about like that much of it. So $100 billion in 2000. That's a big number. By 2002, it was what? 20 billion. That is a massive deflation. The interesting thing is, so there's a break in the data sets from 02 to 06. We don't get back to 100 billion until 2018. Now, it's not just the space industry. Obviously, you had stock market dropping. You had lots of things bad happening in Silicon Valley. But this is a huge, this is a huge event. So now we get to today. Tubed or wiped out. I already talked about the wave. But it's a dangerous time right now. I think they're really good signs, and they're signs that are not so great. So I'm going to talk about both of those. Here's one of the really great signs. And this data is actually a year or two old. Uh, this is from Space Capital, which is a great space finance firm. I'm going to use some of their charts here. So we've got a total of 25 billion investment in space over the last 10 years, and 535 companies. This is global, by the way. Um, and there are space companies outside the US, but most of them are in China, which is another interesting question. Um, so this is good. Lots of companies, lots of venture capital. One of the things I really like about what's happening in the commercial industry, as compared with what happened in 2000, is the capital base is much more robust. It's not just, most of what happened in 2000 was financed by um, corporate debt. This is mostly venture capital. So that's a pretty good thing. The other thing that's interesting is, so that you'll, you all know there are numbers out there about trillion dollar economy, $2.7 trillion economy, all of that kind of stuff. The first thing you need to understand is there are, whole, but there are three different space economies. There's the space hardware economy, which is a tough business. It's really building things with long lead times, very high technical uncertainty, high fixed costs, tough business. Then there is the ground systems, which kind of look more like computers. Um, it's a better industry from a financial standpoint. One of the interesting things about the infrastructure economy is the returns on invested capital are insanely high. And that's mostly because the government pays for all the investment. Uh, that's why people invest in Boeing. Well, maybe not so much now. Maybe Lockheed is a better example. Anyway, British Aerospace even. Anyway, um, the third economy is, is sort of digital economy. It's the applications, data analytics. And that looks like the Silicon Valley internet economy. No surprise, that's where the investment is going. But anyway, it, these are numbers I generated by doing some fairly simple extrapolations, but it's not hard to get to a trillion dollar economy if you accept that the data coming from space counts as part of that. And that you can accept it or not, it doesn't. If you accept it, you have a trillion dollar economy. If you don't, you have a $500 billion economy. But the trillion dollar numbers are real. Numbers that Bank of America throws out a $2.7 trillion number, um, which is um, kind of interesting. The basis for that number was actually done by people that used to work for me when I was at United Launch Alliance. And I know what's behind the numbers, and there ain't much real analytics to it. But this number, trillion dollar number, is not hard to get to. That's good. Here's something else which is interesting. So this is data analytics. This is, this is hardware, infrastructure. All of the money is going into the data analytics. Don't blame the investors. It's a much better investment, as I mentioned. But something to think about. Total commercial investment was $177 billion. Applications investment, this stuff, 
right here, $141 billion. Infrastructure is only $30 billion. That worries me because it means commercial industry is not investing in the hardware. Who's investing in the hardware? The government, which may not be a bad thing, but it is the reality of the economies that we live in in space. So now we're kind of getting to the bad news side of the ledger. If you look at that infrastructure part of the investment, it's dominated by four players, one of which is from the UK, OneWeb. That's not healthy, I don't think. Let's talk about industry valuations. I've only got a couple of minutes, but so I'm gonna pick on the small launch industry, which is just crazy. Most of these are SPACs. In fact, these are all, you guys are all familiar with what SPACs are, special purpose acquisition companies. The overvaluations of these are insane. In fact, without getting into the details, what, what I've done is I took the entire small launch industry, the entire market, and wrapped it up and assumed you had one company that had that entire market, and the net present value calculation is still negative. So um, I've had one conversation with somebody today about the launch industry, about how I did not like it, I was not in love with it. And Jamie, my former student, understands how much I don't love it and I could go on. But this is a problem. What happens when this bubble deflates? Does it implode or does it just sort of deflate? If it implodes, we could end up with something similar to what happened um, in the 2000s. So let's talk about the other really massive part of the economy, satellite constellations. So if you remember from earlier, we had thousands of, uh, we had 1,200 satellites. Now we've got 52,000 satellites at a cost of 148 billion, which this cost is insanely low, to be honest with you. The notion that SpaceX can do all of this for $67 billion is kind of crazy, but it seems like it's happening again. And without getting into a lot of detail, we've actually done some analysis on this. This is looking at, it's crunching a lot of numbers. This is looking at the commercial satellite constellation business in aggregate, and it assumes, which is not a great assumption, but it's a reasonable one, that they're basically going after the consumer internet, actually the commercial internet, fixed base, business, um, massive market, by the way. But still, if you do net present value calculations, they're losing money. So this doesn't say that these industry, these constellations are going to lose money, they're a bad investment, because there are market segments like remote industry that can be very profitable, they're just not that large. What it tells us though is that it's not at all clear that these satellite constellations are gonna take over the internet. And so I think there's... this are going to be much better, much stronger companies than what than they were going in. And then we may again see the real takeoff in this industry, but I really don't know. So just to kind of, just to wrap up here. So I've been in this business literally since I was 11 years old. I've seen a lot of things. I've been a, a, a senior executive at big companies, at small companies. One of the things that I've noticed is that we do a really great job of training engineers. We do a less great job of training people how to run businesses, how to ride the waves, if you will, of space commercialization. So we're a little bit like a bulldog trying to ride the waves. We get to the shore, ultimately, but sometimes it's pretty ugly. This is where we wanna be, right? And so this is how you get there. You come and take my program. Anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Do we, do we do questions now, or we just roll? Any, any questions? Jamie. We need you as the public curmudgeon. 
you mentioned that that was changing gradually over time. Is the rate of change accelerating? Uh, yeah, but in the wrong direction today. Uh, you wanted, um, so the, the question was, they, my students call me the cosmic curmudgeon um, for reasons that you now know, right? And, and I, I t it changes. So earlier this year, I, I would have said that I'm, I'm getting much more positive about things than I have been for the last couple of years. I think with some of the things going on with SPACs, I am very concerned that we are headed to a correction. I just don't know if it's going to be a big correction, a fast correction, or, or a slow correction. So I'm, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about it right now than I was. Um, I still think we will end up where we want to be. I just think the smart money in this business is going to be the money that picks up the pieces, that finds the great assets when their valuations come down to earth, so to speak. And I, I saw at least one other question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, apart from the value of the stock market, what do you think is going to influence what happens next on the money front? Uh, well, the biggest thing is, is not the stock market so much, but the frothy bit of, of SPACs and things like that. Um, I mean, I don't... It's not just SPACs, but I don't know how you get to a $100 billion valuation for SpaceX. I mean, that's, but then I don't know how you get to whatever the valuation of Tesla is either. It just, it sort of defies logic. Um, that's a big bit of it. I think the other really important piece of this that really affects the satellite constellations is what happens with the U.S. and China. You know, we look at these satellite constellations and we assume that there's a, a unified global market. It won't be there will be a Belt and Road market, and there will be a rest of the world market, I think, that I don't think it's going to be a tough sell for Chinese satellite constellations to sell into the U.S. or the Western market. It is going to be a tough sell for U.S. companies, Western companies, to sell into the Belt and Road. So it kind of cuts the market. I don't know if it's in half or a third, something like that. That concerns me. Um, the thing that doesn't concern me is technology. I would like to see better management, but then I'm in the business of training managers, so I, would, I have to say that, right? Yeah. The biggest thing is if we have a major correction, that takes out a lot of money. And it's, space is not the first choice of investors. They are getting more comfortable with it, but they get comfortable with a part of space that... Um, well, we need applications, and that's great, but I, I do worry about the infrastructure side of it. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. What is most interested, interest, needed in the industry now that there is what? What is most needed in the industry now in terms of education and software? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so as I said, we do a great job of training technologists. What we need to do is train people to understand what that technology means in the broader context. So you need to understand, the biggest thing is you need to understand the markets. What's real and what isn't in the markets. You need to understand that business is problem driven. It's not technology driven. You need to understand the regulatory environment. You need to understand the competitive environment. And, um, we don't do a great job of this. We tend, our education systems tend to focus on teaching you disciplines, and that's great. But it's sort of like, I think a, a well-rounded education is like a T. You have a vertical column, if you will, of an expertise, and then you need to cross the T with domain knowledge. I'm getting the get out of here sign, so I'm out of here. Andrew.